Chapter 14 The Shadow of Fear Part 1 No sooner had Winnie gone than winter came in a day. Pat's round window was thick furred with snow. The whispering lane was filled with huge drifts through which Dad and Uncle Tom shoveled a fascinating narrow path until they met at the gate. The piles of stones in the old part of the orchard were marble pyramids. The hill of the mist shone like silver. The hill field was a dazzling white sheet. Even the stony field was beautiful. Pat remembered that the secret field must be lovely, with Wood Queen and Fern Princess standing guard. The graveyard was filled almost to the level of the palling. Sure, an even wild dick would find it hard to get out of that, said Judy, busy providing comforts for cold little creatures, cats and dogs and chickens and children. Pat liked a big storm, especially did she love to snuggle in warm, fluffy blankets and defy the great, dark, wintry night outside her cozy room, hugging her hot water bottle. A hot water bottle was such a nice thing. You needed your toes in it. When your feet were warm as warm could be, you held it close in your arms, and finally you put it against the cold spot in your back. And the first thing you knew, it was morning and the sun was shining through the drift and the hot water bag was an unpleasantly like a clammy dead rat just beside you. It was n rather nice, too, to have one's room all to oneself. Still, she missed Winnie terribly, the blue laughter of her eyes, the silver music of her voice. Just two more weeks and Winnie will be home, she counted exultantly. It was in school that she heard it. Of course, it was May Binney who told her. So... Your Aunt Helen is going to adopt Winnie. Pat stared at her. She isn't, May giggled. Fancy you're not knowing. Of course she is. It's a great thing for Winnie, Ma says. And it might have been you if you hadn't slapped Norma's face. Pat stood staring at May. Something had fallen over her spirit like the cold gray light that swept over the world before a snow squall in November. She was too chilled to resent the fact that Sid must have told May about her slapping Norma. There was no room for any but the one terrible thought. It was only afternoon recess, but Pat rushed to the porch, snatched her hat and coat and started home, stumbling wildly along the deep-rutted, drifted road. Oh, to get home to Mother. Mother now, not Judy. Judy did for little griefs, but for this, only Mother. To tell her this ghastly thing was not true, that nobody had ever thought of such a thing as Winnie going to go live with Aunt Helen. Oh, oh, and what's bringing you home so early? cried Judy as Pat stumbled, half frozen into the kitchen. You've never walked all that way in them roads, and your Uncle Tom was going for you all in his fine new pung. Where's Mother? gasped Pat. Mother, is it? Sure, your dad and her has gone over to the bay shore. They phoned over that your Aunt Frances was down with pneumonia. Whatever it is, it's the matter with you, child. But, for the first time, Pat had nothing to say to Judy. The question she had to ask could not be asked of Judy. Judy rather huffed, let her alone, and Pat ranged the deserted house like a restless ghost. Oh, how empty it was! Nobody there, neither mother, nor father, nor Cuddles, nor Winnie, and perhaps Winnie would never be back. Suppose her laugh would never be heard again at Silverbush. Something's been happening in school, reflected Judy uneasily. I'm hoping she didn't get into a ruckus with her lady teacher. I never could be knowing what the trustees meant by hiring old Arthur Saint's girl for a teacher with her hair the color of a red brick. Pat could eat no supper. Bedtime came, and still father and mother were not back. Pat cried herself to sleep, but she awoke in the night, sat up, remembered sickeningly. Everything was quiet. The wind had gone down, and silver bush was cracking in the frost. Through her window, she could see the faint light of stars over the dark fir trees that grew along the dike between the silver bush and swallowfield pastures. Pat found just then that things always seem worse in the dark. She felt she could not live another minute without knowing the truth. 
resolutely. She got out of bed and lighted her candle. Resolutely, the small white figure marched down the silent hall, past Joe's room and the poet's room, to father's and mother's room. Yes, they were home, sound asleep. A fragrant, adorable cuddles was curled up in her little crib, but for the first time, Pat did not gloat over her. Long Alec and his tired wife, just fallen soundly asleep after a cold drive over vile roads, were awakened to see a desperate little face bending over them. Child, what's the matter? Are you sick? Oh, Dad, Aunt Helen isn't going to adopt Winnie. She isn't, is she, Dad? Look here, Pat, Dad was stern. Have you come here and wakened your mother and me just to ask that? Oh, Dad, I had to know. Mother, understandingly, put a slender hand on Pat's shaking arm. Darling, she's not going to adopt her, but she may keep her for a while and send her to school. It would really be a great thing for Winnie. Do you mean Winnie wouldn't come back here? It isn't settled yet. Aunt Helen only threw out a hint. Of course, Winnie will be home often. Part 2 the following week of dark, tortured days was the hardest Pat had ever known in her life. She could not eat, and the sight of Winnie's vacant place at meals reduced her to tears. Her family found it rather hard to make excuses for what they thought was her unreasonable behavior. "'Just humor her a little,' pleaded Judy. "'She's that worked up and miserable she doesn't know which end of her's up. A bird could be, couldn't be living on what she eats. "'You spoil her, Judy.' said Long Alex severely. He was out of patience with Pat's moping. Everybody do be the better of a bit of spoiling now and then, said Judy loyally, but she tried to bring Pat into a more reasonable frame of mind. Don't you want Winnie to get an education? She could get an education at home, sobbed Pat. Not much of one. Oh, oh, I'd have ye known the gardeners don't be like the binnies. We're not going to educate Suzanne, says me, Madam Binney. Soon as she'd get through Queens, she'd marry, and the money'd be wasted. No, no, my jewel. The gardeners are a different braid of cats. Winnie's thirteen. Sure, and she'll be soon wanting to study for her entrance. And who's old Arthur Saint's daughter for that, I'm asking ye? You'll never convince me she knows a word of the Latin and French. English is good enough for anybody, protested Pat. You'll find it isn't good enough for Queens, retorted Judy. Winnie'd be able to go to the Summerside schools, and your Aunt Helen could do more for her than your dad ever can, with his one small farm, and the five of ye eating it up. Now stop fretting me, Jewel, and come and cut rags for me while I do a bit of hooking. Then came the letter from Aunt Helen for Dad. Pat, her hands locked behind her so that no one could see them trembling, stood mutely by while Long Alec deliberately tried on two pairs of spectacles, scrutinized the stamp, remarked that Helen had always been a pretty writer, hunted up a knife to slit the envelope, took out the letter. Outside in the yard, somebody was laughing. How dared anybody laugh at such a moment? Helen says Brian is bringing Winnie home Saturday, he announced casually. So I guess she's given up the notion of keeping her. I always thought she would, so that's that. Oh, I must be flying, thought Pat, as she ran to tell Judy. Judy admitted satisfaction. It do be just as well, I'm thinking. Helen was a bit of a crank, and I'm not thinking it's a wise-like thing to break up a family any sooner than need be. Isn't a family one of the loveliest things in the world, Judy? cried Pat. Oh, look at Gentleman Tom. Isn't he sitting cute? Oh, oh, it's the different looking girl ye are from the morning. Everything pleases ye tonight, even the way a poor cat arranges his hams, chuckled Judy, who was overjoyed to see her darling happy again. Pat ran out in the twilight to tell the good news to the silver bush and the leafless maples. She looked with eyes of love at the old snow-roofed house, drawing its cloak of trees around it in the still mild winter evening. Even in winter, Silverbush was lovely because of what it sheltered and hoped for. Then she ran back in and up to the garret to set a light for Jingle. Jingle had been her only comfort during the past dreadful week. 
Even Sid hadn't seemed to worry much whether Winnie came home or not. He hoped she would, of course, but he didn't lose sleep over it. Jingle had always assured Pat she would. Who, he thought, wouldn't come back to Silverbush if she could? So now he came to share in Pat's joy. The two of them waded back along Jordan to happiness. It was buried in snow, but the haunted spring was still running freshly, hung about with jewels. How lovely the silvery world was! How lovely the white hills of snow! They did not get home till nearly eight, and Judy scolded. I'm not having ye roman off with any jingle if ye can't be home and to bed at the proper time. What is the proper time for going to bed, Judy? laughed Pat. Every word was a laugh with Pat tonight, and oh, how good supper tasted. Sure now, and you're asking a question that's never been answered, chuckled Judy. Saturday came, with more March wind and snow. Oh, it shouldn't storm the day Winnie was coming home. Perhaps Uncle Brian would bring her if it stormed, but in the late afternoon the sun came out below the storm cloud and made a dazzling fair world. The rooms of Silverbush were all filled with a golden light from the clearing western sky. All the gardens and yards and orchards were pranked out with the exquisite shadows of leafless trees. And then they came, right out of the heart of the wild winter sunset. Winnie was very glad Aunt Helen had decided not to keep her. She said I laughed too much and it got on her nerves, Winnie told Pat. Besides, I put pepper in the potatoes instead of salt the day her maid was away. Oh, by mistake, of course. That settled it. She said I had the makings of a sloppy housekeeper. Silverbush is glad to hear you laugh, whispered Pat, hugging her savagely. The storm came up again in the night. Pat woke up and heard it, remembered that everything was all right and sank happily to sleep again. What difference now how much it stormed? All her dear ones were near her, safe under the same kindly roof, dad and mother and little cuddles, Joe and Sydney, Judy in her own eerie, with her black gentleman Tom curled up at her feet, Thursday and Snickle Fritz behind the kitchen stove, and Winnie was home, home to stay.